Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope. Like wild are in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come and bring us now.
no higher name, Jesus, Son of God. You laid down your perfect life. You are the sacrifice, Jesus, Son of God. You are Jesus, Son. thank you for being here today we thank you for showing up and moving we thank you for each and every blessing that you've poured out over us Lord God whether it be financially our health the health of our family the safety of all of us Lord God we thank you we thank you for the freedom that we have to come here and worship you in freedom and truth Lord God, take these tithes and offerings. Use them for your will. Use them to expand your kingdom. We are doing this out of obedience of your word, Lord God. We love you. Amen. When you walk into the room, sickness starts to vanish. Every hopeless situation ceases to exist and when you walk into the room the dead begin to rise because there is resurrection life in all you do we love you we'll never stop we can't live without you Jesus Our hearts are yours, we want you, we want you, come and consume. 
Well, hey, we're going we're gonna to do a, a couple weeks on, speaking of exciting, we're going to talk for a couple weeks about giving. Come on, isn't it a fun thing to give? How many love to give? You know, the Bible says it's more blessed to give than to receive, and I think some of you have tapped into that and you understand that. There's an understanding that we can give not just of our money, but of our time and our, our service, but we're, mainly we're going to be talking about finances today. I've been talking about, about it a little bit recently with some people, and I've heard it come up a number of times recently, so I just kind of wanted to talk specifically about tithing today and uh, what that is about. And I've, uh, you know, some people, some people don't, some pastors don't like to talk about money at all. They think it's, it's maybe too self-serving or something, because obviously that, uh, you know, that's kind of part, part of how you get paid is when people get, give money to the church. But for me, and I really believe it's a, it's a blessing to be able to talk about money and to be able to help people to understand these kingdom principles because it helps you, amen? And uh, when we understand the biblical principle of tithing and giving, uh, it, it helps us and it really sets us free in a lot of areas. And I have a couple of PowerPoints that I'll, I'll show along with this, but the Bible has a whole bunch of different reasons why we should give. But some of them are, uh, number one, to meet any needs in the local body. You know, if we, have, if we have sick people here, if we have um, hurting people that need some help, some money, uh, provide for, for, for a place to live, which we've done, and, and uh, we continue to look for those opportunities, uh, even just to help our own people that might be struggling. Uh, number two, to feed the poor and clothe the naked, even in the community and, and around the world. Um, but specifically, we need to care for those that are among us in the household of faith, and and, uh, and yet to have a bigger vision for the world. A third thing would be to pay uh, the workers. The worker is worthy of his wage, the scripture says. And so we, pr we pay uh, the leaders in the church and pastors and, and uh, uh, other workers in the house of God. And the, the fourth thing would be to send forth laborers. I think there's a PowerPoint, the first one for that, Ben. Um, to send forth laborers into the fields. Uh, missionaries and people that we we just send out to be able to help support them and we have a whole bunch of different partners that we support around the world uh, through Harvest Time Outreach through the money that that we give weekly a portion of that goes out uh, into the kingdom as a matter of fact for the last number of years we've we've tithed as a church way more than 10 percent to missions uh, usually it's closer to 17 to, to 20 percent and so we're uh, we're pretty thrilled about that in addition, we give a whole bunch more money uh, on top of the on top of the tithe. That, that's just the stuff that we count. The other stuff that just comes in and goes out, that's not even what we count as actually part of that. And so, uh, we're blessed to be able to do that. Amen. And uh, it's amazing how a small group sometimes can have an impact if we all do our part. And so, that's exciting to be able to do that. So, as we look at the Bible verses about tithing this morning, there's a temptation. There's a temptation to say that. Um, Number one, it's Old Testament, 
why do we have to deal with that? It's Old Testament. Now we're going to show you some truths about that and uh, why we need to pay attention to it, even though it is a lot of Old Testament. But there's also a tendency to, we get this idea that because God, of the promises of God, you know, that you give and it'll be given unto you, you sow and you reap, you always reap more than you sow. And there's so many promises that would indicate, okay, if we do this, God's going to do this. And so it's almost like if we give, we can manipulate God somehow to bless us or to increase us. And how many know that that's a wrong attitude for giving to try to get something? We want to give so we can give more really should be our heart. We know that there's a blessing that's in giving. We know that there's a blessing that comes when we give to God, that when we, especially when we tithe, and that God does a whole bunch of other things. And so we want to just be able to say, yes, Lord, we, we, we recognize there's a blessing, but we want to give so we can give more. Our heart is just to give more. I, always, I, I like to say we want to live to give. Amen. Just be givers and just be liberal with our giving. Praise the Lord. Uh, get, you know, the Bible says that a, a lot of stuff... Um, about it, but our motive should be to give so we can get more. Give more. Um, we don't want to use it as a formula. Amen? And so a tithing really, um, tithing's really a test. And um, it, the word tithe means a tenth. It means, it's just, you know, 10% basically is what a tithe is. And the number 10 in the scriptures is, is a number of testing. Okay, it's a number of, you see, there were, there were uh, how many plagues in Egypt? I'll give you a clue. We're talking about 10. <laughs> how many plague, plagues in Egypt? There were 10. How many commandments are there? How many times did God test Israel in the wilderness? Yeah, 10. How many, how many times were, was, was, was Jacob's wages changed? Ten times. How many days was Daniel tested? Ten days. How many virgins in Matthew 25 were tested? Ten. How many tests in Revelation 2.10? You can check it out, look it up. Um, how many disciples were there? <laughs> that's, a, that's a Robert Morris line right there. Uh, that's a little trick. So tithing's a test, really. And it's, it's Old Testament, but it's also New Testament. Jesus said in Matthew 23, 23 that you should tithe. He, he, was talking to, uh, he was talking to people that were really good at obeying the law, but they, were, they weren't good at doing some of the little important things that, that they should keep doing. And they wanted to be seen outwardly, but the little inward things of their heart they weren't so good at. And, and uh, he said, you should have done these things, but you should also, you should also tithe. You should pay the the cumin and the mint and, and whatever they were giving. but and see, So he said, don't neglect the weightier things of the law, but also do these things. And so Jesus said in Matthew 23, 23, you need to keep tithing. And uh, if Jesus said it, how many know that that's probably enough that we should do it? But we're going to show you even a little bit more. There's a lot of things. That, how many know that there's just a lot of things that we practice that are Old Testament? Okay? Thou shalt not commit adultery. I mean, if that's true then, it's true now. And some of the principles in the Old Testament are, are forever true. You know, some of the, the moral laws of the Old Testament we still practice. And some of the, you know, the things about eating or some of the things that were specific to Israel at that time, you know, we don't practice those things. But the, the things that were true then are true now. The things that were right then are right now. The things that were wrong then are wrong now. You got a wallet on you, Mel? Can, could, I, could I have that? Thanks, buddy. <laughs> Old Testament, thou shalt not steal, right? Right? That's Old Testament. Don't worry about that. Is there any money in there, by the way? There's money in it? Holy cow, there's all kinds of money in here. Man. You see the way that works? We just kind of pick and choose the things that we want from the Old Testament, and then the others, you know, but... But the Old Testament still applies. In fact, Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill it and to complete it. And so we still, um, we still go by those moral standards that were set up throughout the Old Testament. And there are some laws and rules that were specific for Jews at that time. But the principles that we're talking about really last forever. And, and uh, 
It's so true. It's, it doesn't change, and, and God doesn't change. Amen? He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. His word doesn't change. Hallelujah. If it was right under the law then, it's, it's right now. If it was wrong then, it's wrong now. It's a, it's a principle, an ordinary principle of Scripture. The second thing we want to talk about is tithing is biblical. Let's look at Genesis 4, 18-20. And you know, there's really... I have no motive right now in teaching this other than I just feel like almost yearly we need to talk about it because there's new people that come in. There's many of you have probably heard this many times and, and it's not new to you, but for, for many people it's, it's kind of a new thing and, and, and I really love it when people understand it and I just think it's something that even if you've heard it before we should go over it and remind ourselves uh, of what it is that we're doing. And so Genesis 14 uh, it's, this is about Melchizedek and Abraham in verses uh, 18 through 20. Genesis 14, I'm sorry, I went to Genesis 4. Did I mess you up too? Genesis 14. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High. He was a priest in Salem. Place of, and Salem in the scripture is, is peace. You know, it's a place of peace. And, and uh, he was the priest of God Most High. And, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies unto your hand. And he gave him a tithe of all. And this is Abraham gave Melchizedek a tithe of all. And a lot of biblical scholars believe that Melchizedek was, was a type of Christ, or actually Christ himself as he appeared to Abraham. And so the interesting thing about this is that this is the first place the tithe is mentioned. This is 500 years before the law. So people say, well, the tithing, that's just, that's just law, that's just Jewish law for Jewish people. And this was actually 500 years before the law that, that God started this. And Abraham is, how many know that Abraham is our father? He's our, he's our spiritual father. We're grafted in we're the seed of Abraham. Do you agree that we're the seed of Abraham, that we've been grafted in by faith in Jesus Christ? We become the children of Abraham. We become, we, we become children of the promise. We're, we, be, we become Jews, really. We're grafted in by, by the, because we're the seed of Abraham through faith in Jesus Christ. And so he's our spiritual father. He did this 500 years before the law. He gave him a tenth. He gave him a tithe. And so uh, it's a principle of the first. Tithing is a principle of the first. And there's a lot of principles in the Bible, and there's one called the, the principle of the first. And God is the first, amen? Jesus is the firstborn among all. God is, is the one and only. He's the first and only God. He's the true God. He's the living God. And there's this principle of the first. And God said, the first belongs to me. The first of your field, the first of your flock. It, throughout Scripture, there's a principle of the first. And uh, when you put God first, everything else falls into place. How many have figured that one out? Charlie mentioned it already this morning. Is that We need to keep putting Him first and keep, keep Him number one. Rob mentioned it this morning in prayer as well. There seems to be a theme going on here that, that He needs to be first. And somehow it's easy for other things to creep in, but He's the first. Amen? He's our first love. He's, he's the first one. And so uh, it's the principle of the first. Let's look at Exodus 13. And this is really Old Testament stuff here, but there's really some powerful truth to it. As we look at Exodus 13, uh, we'll look at 1 and 2, and then we'll, we'll skip down to like verse 12. Now the Lord spoke, no that's 12, 13, then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Consecrate to me all the firstborn, whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and beast, it is mine. It is mine. It's like God says, the firstborn belongs to me. It's mine. It's mine. And then later on in, in about verse 12, he says, You should set apart to the Lord all that open the womb, that is, every firstborn that comes from an animal which you have. The males shall be the Lord's. But every firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb, and, you will not re and if you will not redeem it, then you shall break its neck. And all the firstborn among men, among your sons, you shall redeem. So it shall be when your son asks for ask you in the time to come, saying, What is this uh, that you shall say to him, By strength of the hand, the Lord has brought us out of Egypt and the, out of the house of bondage. And so they, they, 
God was telling them, you need to make this sacrifice. The first of your, you know, your, the, your firstborn belongs to me and you should give it to me. And he's saying the firstborn must be sacrificed or redeemed. And he's talking about a lamb and a donkey. A lamb is a type of a, uh, um, you know, a, a spotless lamb, a perfect sacrifice. And a donkey is, is, a, is, is unclean. A lamb is a type of clean. A donkey is a, a type of unclean. So all, for all your animals... He's saying this, this needs to happen. The firstborn must be sacrificed or redeemed. And, uh, and these are principles that carry out through the scripture. How do you know if, if, the, if they're to be sacrificed or redeemed? If it's, clean, if it's a clean firstborn, it must be sacrificed. So if you have this clean animal, it's perfect, it's a male, it must be sacrificed. If it's not, it has to be redeemed or paid for by the blood of another animal. And uh, it's very interesting as you study this. It's, I know it's kind of confusing as you look at it right now. But, you know, it, it's kind of a type of what Jesus did for us. Amen. How many of us were born unclean? Because of sin and because of the sin of Adam. We were born unclean and we had to be redeemed by something clean, by someone clean, right? And Jesus is that, that sacrifice that was paid for us. Amen. He paid for us by, by his blood and uh, we were born unclean. Jesus was born clean. And he's, he's fully God, he's fully man, amen? He was, he was sinless, and he paid the sacrifice for us. A clean had to be sacrificed so that the unclean could be redeemed. Amen? So the firstborn redeems the rest. And, and it doesn't say, it doesn't say, and we're talking about the principle of the first here, okay? So it doesn't say, okay, when you've got enough, when you've got a whole bunch of animals, then select one and bring it to me. You know, when you know that you're going to be okay and you've got enough, you're, you're doing well, then you select one of those animals and sacrifice. He says, no, I want the first one. The first one belongs to mine, belongs to me. And so it's a principle that, that uh, we had to give, the, he, had to, he required the first one first. And, and Jesus is kind of God's first one, amen? He's the first, he's the first man, really, born. He's the first among many. He was born, he's the perfect sacrifice. We sang it even this morning. And he's, in a sense, he's God's tithe. Jesus, God gave Jesus before he knew what we were going to do with Jesus, amen? He paid for our sins while we were yet sinners. We were dying in sin, and Jesus had already been sacrificed for us. So, the first portion is very important. It belongs to God. God wants the first portion, and uh, Jericho was the first city. You can study this principle throughout the, the scriptures. Jericho was the first city. God required that the that the, the first of the spoils would come into the house of the Lord uh, from, from, that, from the spoils of Jericho. And so throughout the scriptures, God talks about this whole um, idea, this principle of the first. Amen. Bring the first into the house of the Lord. The first, the first fruits must be offered, must be given to God. Let's look at some more uh, proof of that in Proverbs 3, 9 and 10. Are you with me? Are you tracking? I know we're talking a little Old Testament stuff here, but it's important to kind of lay out this foundation of the first. Proverbs 3, 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase, so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. In Exodus 23, 19. Exodus 23:19 The first of the first fruits of your land you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God you shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk so you bring the first fruits into the house of the Lord and you notice in the scriptures when it says it says to bring the tithe bring the tithe into the house of the Lord it never says to give the tithe it says to bring it because you really can't give something that doesn't belong to you. God says it's mine, right? Just like he does with the tithe. He said, the tithe belongs to me. We're going to get to that in a minute in Malachi. And so we bring, we bring it to God. Amen. We, just, we can't give something that's not ours. And so we bring it to the house of the Lord. And in every place, it talks about bringing it into the house of the Lord. That's where we bring it. That's where we give it. Hallelujah. The tithe comes to the house of God. Amen. Bring all the tithes to the Lord. 
Robert Moore says there's two, there's two choices that you have with the tithe. You can, either, you can either bring it or you can steal it. And uh, <laughs> we don't want to steal it, amen? And we're going to talk about that in a, in a second when we get to Malachi. But those are our two choices. Um, there's a reason also why God received... Have you ever wondered about Cain and Abel? And why God, you know, received Abel's offering and not Cain's? Anybody ever wonder that? Let's look at it in Genesis 4, 3 to 5. In light of what we've just been talking about, let's look at it. Genesis 4, 3 to 5. In the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. So it, it's interesting when you slow it down and you read that, verse 3, and it came to pass, or in the process of time, it came to pass. In the process of time, it came to pass. It's almost like sometime later, Cain decides to bring an offering to God. But for Abel, it says that he brought of his firstborn, the firstborn of his flock. Amen. He brought it. He, he understood this thing of giving God what's God's first and bring it to God first. Abel, or Cain, uh, in the process of time, you know, maybe after he had enough for himself, he brought it. But it says that God didn't respect his offering. You could say it this way, maybe he, maybe he gave what he wanted when he wanted. Isn't that the way we operate sometimes? We give, we give what we want when we want. We want and, and, and as a matter of fact, we want to give it to certain places and which is all good we can give money to certain places and you want to give money to a university or you want to give money to some TV evangelist or you want to give some money to someplace else that's all good we can do that but the Bible says the tithe belongs to God the tithe is God's he owns it bring it to God bring it to the house of the Lord and uh, and so you know I don't I don't feel we should be so eager to just spread it out all over the place we, we have to do it God's way. Amen. And God says, it belongs to me. Hallelujah. A fourth thing I want to want to show you is that the tithe belongs to God. We've already, we've already mentioned that. Um, but it's kind of, it's, it's one of these things that, you know, if you, if you get, if you get 10, $100 bills for your, for your pay from your job, how much are you going to tithe on that? According to what we've been talking about. You get ten one hundred dollar bills. How much is that? One of you math people. It's not a trick. Thousand dollars. How much are we going to tithe on that? Hundred dollars, right? Ten percent. So how do you know if you're getting paid in cash, which one to give first? Which one has the blessing on it? You're supposed to give the first one, right? Which one? The first one that came into your hand. Really, it's probably the first one that goes out of your hand. Amen. The, the first person that you pay should be the Lord. And, you know, you don't have to be legalistic about this. You don't have to, you know, get all nervous if you don't pay God first and you paid your bill first or something. But, but the, the principle is that we should give God the first. It's, it belongs to Him. And we, that should be a priority that we live by. We give, to what, we give God to what belongs to Him first. Amen. Not what's left over after we pay the mortgage, after we pay the car payment and buy groceries and get, you know, shoes and everything else. Then we say, oh, do we have a few bucks left to give to God? That's, that's kind of not how we, we don't want to do it like that. Amen. We want to give it to God first and give the tithe to God first. You don't have to be legalistic. You don't have to be crazy about it. But it just should be a principle that we live by. It should be a, a principled thing that we do that, okay, when I get paid. First thing I want to do is, is give my money to God. At the beginning, amen, not at the end, after everything else is taken care of. Okay, let's move to, to Malachi 3. This is pro these are probably some of the most quoted verses about tithing that we, that we know of, and you've probably heard them before. And Malachi is right before Matthew, the last book of the Old Testament. Some people say, I wish it could have been one book further would be a lot less confusing or, you know, they, they'd be clear that this is really a New Testament principle. But um, it's, about as, it's about as close as you can get right here in Malachi 3, 8 through 12. Even we could back up to verse 6 
God says, For I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. From the days of your fathers you have gone away from my ordinance and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you said, In what way shall we return? And then it says in verse 8, Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, In what ways have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You're cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, so that you will not... So, so he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all the nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. And so, you know, the question, how do we rob God? Rob God. Is it possible for us to rob God? According to the scripture, it somehow is. But it's like, do you think that God really needs our money? He's the king of the world, amen? He's got it all. He, the, all the gold, all the silver, everything belongs to God. He doesn't really need our money, but, but he needs our obedience. And he needs us to, to uh, participate with him in this. And he says that we actually rob him. We rob him of an opportunity to bless us. We rob him of an opportunity for God's grace to shine on our life and for his light to shine on our life when we don't do this. And so he says there's some, some real reasons for this. He said... Um, that there, be, there may be food in my house. So the tithe belongs to the local storehouse. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse. The storehouse is the place where you're fed. The storehouse is the place where, where you're getting your food, your bread, amen? And so the church and uh, all these other scriptures that we, we, we looked at and, and, and many more talk about bringing the tithe into the house of God. You know, bring it to the altar. And so um, we need to bring the tithe into the local storehouse which is the church, the place that you get fed. So there'll be food in my house, so that the, the work of the Lord can continue, so that the, the, the word of God will be strong, so that the word of, of God will, be, will keep going out and there'll be food in God's house and there'll be opportunity for people to come and, and to change their lives and to, to, to know the Lord and so on. And so um, it doesn't mean we shouldn't minister to other places and give to other places and, and share with all kinds of things, but that should be over and above the tithe, is what I feel. That should be over and above the tithe. So if, if we want to give to some other uh, mission, some other opportunity, by the way, today I'm going to give you an opportunity to sow something to, into Haiti. Amen? How many have had Haiti on your heart at all, with all the stuff that's happening there? Such an impoverished nation, and then they get, you know, then they get an earthquake, and they just one thing after another. We're going to give you an opportunity today to sow into Haiti. But, um, you know, the place where you get fed, so, that, so there'll be increase. And, and we should give into other places for sure. But, um, you know, one way to look at it is, I think, Mel, you mentioned this the other day. We were talking about it. And, you know, if you're giving to some TV ministry, if you're giving to some person that you happen to like that's out there somewhere, or some university or whatever... Are they going to be there for you when you need something? Are they going to be there to do a funeral for you? Are they going to be there with the word of the Lord for you? Are they going to be there to lay hands on you and pray with you? Are they going to be there to, to help you through a hard time? Are they going to be there for you, you know, in the midst of a marriage crisis or whatever it is? You know, and you have to think about it that way. That's why the tithe really should, would, should come to the local storehouse. Um, you know, you need prayer. You need a visitation. Who are you going to call? And, and God says some cool things here. He says, you can test him in this. You can test him in this. Try it, he goes. Just, just try me and see if I won't open up the windows of heaven and pour, you, pour out on you such a blessing. You know, and he says, if you do this, you're blessed. If you don't do this, you're under a curse. I don't know about you, but I want to be under a blessing and not under a curse, amen? I want to live under a, the, the full blessing and the full benefit, the full favor of God, and not, not have a portion of my money cursed or a portion of my income or a portion of my life. And so I want to experience the blessing of God in my life. And, um, you know, people have said, you know, the, the 90% blessed goes a lot further than the 100% that's not blessed. Amen? And so... I want, my, I want my money blessed, I want my, 
my stuff blessed, oh, I want the blessing of God on my life. And sometimes I think if you look back, Charlie, even with your, your incident with your camper, you know, it's like, wow, that sounds like that could have been a bad, bad deal. You know, it could have got off into another lane, crashed into somebody. I mean, all kinds of things, uh, you know, and all these little ways that God just covers us. Amen. Is all, the, all of a sudden, you know, he just saves us from something. We don't know how many times that's happened. Or you just think of the blessing of God upon your life as you look back through the years, especially if you've been a tither and you can see, you know, you know, and I know that there's a lot of people who make a lot of money who don't tithe, don't even go to church. Amen. The, the, the rain falls on the just and the unjust. God is merciful and people do really well, even without him in their life. But one day, their time is up. Amen. One day they can't, you know, they can't take their toys with them into heaven. You know, he who dies with the most toys doesn't win. Right? And so one, one day their day is coming, and the day, of the, the day of justice is coming upon this earth and upon all people. And so, uh, but the favor of God, the blessing of God, it's just another way that he opens up his blessing on our lives. And he says we can test him in it, try him in it. If you don't think this works, just, just try it. Amen? That's what he's saying. And see if the windows don't have it, don't open up. And see if he doesn't rebuke the devourer. And the devourer is Satan. He's the, the enemy. He was, he's out to kill, steal, and destroy. He wants to steal. He wants to destroy you. He wants to take from you. And God says, I'll rebuke him. I'll stop him in your life. This is one of the ways that God stops the enemy in, our, in his tracks for us. God says, I'll rebuke the enemy. I'll, I'll tie up the enemy for you, and your field will be blessed. Your job will be blessed. Amen? The work of your hands. He said he blessed the work of your hands. The work of your hands will be blessed. God said he would do this. Your land will be blessed. You know, your vine will continue to bear fruit. You know, the scripture says that, that when we're faithful to him, that we'll bear fruit in old age. We'll just keep bearing fruit. Amen? Keep bearing fruit until, until our final breath we can bear fruit for Jesus. And so your vine will just never stop bearing, bearing fruit. And this is one of the ways that God accomplishes that. Your land will even be blessed, he said. And nations, nations will call you blessed. People will see it. Nations is ethnos, it's people, amen? It's groups of people. People will see that you're blessed. They'll see the blessing of God on your life. They'll see the favor of God on your life. And it'll be a good place to tell them about Jesus. When they point it out and say, man, how come your life seems so good? You know, how come it just seems so right? And you can have an opportunity to say, well, I'll tell you what, it wasn't always this way. There was a time in my life when I didn't know Jesus, but now I do. And his blessing, his favor is on my life. Your land will be a delightful place. It'll be a delightful place. I mean, there'll be joy in your house. Amen? There's fruit on your vine. There's joy in your house. There's joy in your camp. There's life in your space. Amen? There's, there's stuff happening in your house. There's stuff happening in your life. Uh, it's a delightful place. Hallelujah. How many want your home to be a delightful place? How many want your families to be a delightful place? And when you gather, it's just, you just sense the presence of the Lord, and it's delightful. And, and uh, those, are the, those are some of the things that happen as we participate in this little thing called tithing, as we bring it to God, as we give it to God, as we trust God with it. And really, when we talk about tithing, if you, look, if you study the Old Testament, you'd be surprised to find out that it's not just 10%. It's actually, it comes out to more like 23% what they gave when, they, when, they, when you figure in some of the other offerings and things that they were supposed to, required to give to. It's a lot more than 10%. And so 10%, 10 is just a starting place. If you want to give 20%, hallelujah, amen. If you want to give 30%, if you, want to, if you want to get to the place in your life where you give 80% to the Lord, 90% to the Lord, and you live off the 10%, there are people that do that. It's amazing, and some of the stories I've heard. But what an opportunity to just be a blessing and to give to God. Uh, bring it to God, amen? The principle of the first, that it, it belongs to God. God said that the first belongs to me, and uh, that the tithe belongs to me. And we don't want to rob God of an opportunity to bless us, really, is what we're doing. Uh, when we withhold the tithe and when we don't tithe. And so, we have a lot of people that tithe in this church, and that's really one of the reasons why we've been able to do a lot with the resources that God has given as far as impacting, you know, missions and, and, and things around the world and partners that we've partnered with for a long time. And uh, it's a wonderful thing. It's a blessing. Amen? 
But I'm sharing this because I want, you know, if you're questioning, if you're wondering about it, search it out for yourself. Don't take my word. Dig it out. Get in the scriptures and look and see if this thing isn't a principle from Genesis to Revelation. It's something that God shows, that God does, and all kinds of different ways that he shows it, and that he wants us to participate. Give the first. Give the best. You know, I always tell people, like, we take up offerings for, uh, for uh, countries or places or whatever, you know, I love when people go buy brand new stuff to put in the offering. You know, I've gone to Africa with, with clothes and Russia and different places, and I don't ever want to get there and pull, pull out a, a, a pair of ripped up pants or a, a dirty shirt with spots all over it or, you know, somebody's used underwear or whatever. It's like, you know what I mean? It's like, let's give our best to God. Give Him the first, and give Him the first of our increase, and, and give our best, and give the best of our time. And we talked about last week, you know, doing it with a good heart. You know, whatever you do, do your work heartily. It's for the Lord rather than for men. Amen? Just do it, just do it as unto the Lord. Hallelujah. We could have used that scripture yesterday, Rob. We were, uh, we were taking some tile off the floor on the building next door. And, the, you know, the first few pieces, these kids got in on it too, the first pieces, first few pieces came off nice and easy, and I thought, oh, this is going to be a piece of cake. And after about ten pieces, the rest was slave labor. I mean, you got blisters, I got blisters, anybody that was in there for a while trying to push those tile off got some blisters. And, and I, I actually thought of the verse as we were doing it, let's just be, be merry and just do this unto the Lord. And whatever you do, do it unto the Lord. Do it heartily as unto the Lord. And and because uh, it's the Lord that you serve. Amen. He's the one that we give to. He's the one that uh, is our supply. How many know it all belongs to him anyway? It's the, you know, whether it's ten percent, you can get hung up on ten percent. You know, you know, give five percent. I don't care. It's like biblically I think ten percent is a good number, and we just talked about it for quite a while. Uh, but if you want to give five, if you want to give 20, don't get hung, hung up on the percentage so much, but it all belongs to God. I think we should just be generous with our giving and ask God what we should give. Amen? And 10% is just a good starting place as far as I'm concerned. But, um, you know, pray about it. Ask God and test Him in it. He says, test me. This is one thing that, this is one area where you can just go ahead and test God and see if this doesn't work and see if He doesn't open some things up in your life. And, I, you know, how do you count the blessings of God? How do you count the blessings of God? I mean, it's like, when I look back in my life, I've, I've, I'm way more blessed than I deserve. How about you? I'm way more blessed than I deserve. And when I look at my family, when I look at my kids and my grandkids, when I look at you know, just things that I've been able to do, it's been the blessing of God. It's been the favor of God on my life. Part of it, I believe, is because we've been faithful in tithing all these years. You know, and so it's just like, you know, there was a time, I think, where we, we felt like, are we really tithing? And when we add up the numbers, or are we just giving a certain amount? And it was convicting, so we had to raise the number, amen? And so, God blesses us. And God blesses, and God says in the New Testament, He loves a cheerful giver. You know, and, and He talked, and there are stories in the New Testament, of Jesus Himself talked about the woman who gave her last two cents. Amen, that was a huge gift, because she gave it all. She gave it, it might not have been very much, but she gave it all, whatever she had, and, and uh, that's, the, that's the way to live, just to give, amen? So I want to 